As you might just about have been able to make out from the title of this video, what I'm going to be talking about today is the dry principle. Don't repeat yourself. And that can be really applied in two ways. One, don't repeat yourself in terms of writing the same code over and over again, put things in base classes, that sort of thing. But what I'm going to be looking at today is the idea of don't repeat yourself, actually don't execute the same code twice when it's not necessary. And that's going to apply to the use of Blazor WebAssembly, particularly with pre-rendering. Now, quite a while ago, when .NET 8 came out, I did a video looking at the various models that we can have for Blazor, and the one that I think is probably my favorite is this idea of WebAssembly with pre-rendering. Let's take a quick look at the application we've got for this. So here we've got a Blazor WebAssembly application, and it's got the two parts. It's got the client code and also the server code that serves this up, which is necessary for the pre-rendering. And if we run it up, we'll just see what happens and drag over the browser. And what you can see here, we've got this simple application. We've got a list of books. We've just got another page that we can navigate to. So we have some kind of navigation. And then we can click on any particular book and just get some details popped up. So nothing particularly fancy going on in there. And the way that's all working in the server, I've just set up a very simple couple of endpoints. Authors will come to in a later video, but we've just got some dummy data for a list of books. And that's being served out on the minimal API when we ask for API slash books. And that's what's being picked up in our client. If we look at the home page there, then we're making down here this request back to the original API for books to have a look at those. But we're doing that with this idea of pre-rendering, because if we look at the app.razor, we can see that the render mode is this interactive web assembly. And although it doesn't say it explicitly, that includes the idea of pre-rendering. I can turn that off if I want to, because what I could put in here is say new, and then interactive web assembly render mode, but pass in the, as the parameter there, we could put in a false to turn off that pre-rendering, which is actually the default turned on. And what I'll just also put in here so we can see what's happening, I'm just gonna put in a paragraph and put in here some static content just so we can see what's happening. Because now if we run it up, we can see that it displays the static context straight away and then a bit later puts those books in there. And the reason it's doing that is because if we look at the page source, all that is being delivered is basically just that bit of static content and then everything else has to be added to the DOM via the Blazor runtime in WebAssembly. And so it takes a little while to download that. And that's why you get that delay. If I just refresh that, we can just see the static content and then we get the delay on there. And if you're doing WebAssembly standalone, you get that little circle that gives you up to 100% to give you some tracking bit loading. We could put that in there, but we can see that's the problem that we have this slight delay. And that is what is fixed if we go to using pre-rendering. So if we get rid of that static content, and I could have just set that to true, but actually that's what we had in the first place because this interactive web assembly that we can see up there, that is just actually a predefined constant that gives us the entire of that with the true in there. So we might as well use that. But now if we run this, what we see when we run it up, is that we've immediately got the content there. Let me just refresh that and you'll see how quickly we get the content in there. And if we look at the page source now, we can see that it's actually loaded in with all of that table that is displaying the information about the books. So that's generated on the server, just like you'd have got with a Razor Pages or an MVC application. So it's delivered much more quickly to the browser and then in the background, all of the stuff for WebAssembly loads into the browser, and so you can still have the interaction that you get with a WebAssembly application. But you'll have noticed also a slight problem there, because when I do the reload, you can see it loads, and then there we get that little flicker. See that again? And that is at the point at which we are repeating ourselves, because if we go into the code and put in a break on the home page, and at this point here, where we are loading the data, if I then refresh this again, we hit that breakpoint. And if you look at the call stack, you can tell this is the code executing on the server. So this is that pre-rendering where it generates the initial page. That then gets delivered. 
But then once Blazor has loaded into the browser, we're now calling the same uninitialized async on the same component, but now we're doing it in the browser, and so we get the data again. And that's clearly slowing things down, and it's also why we get that flicker. Again, if I just refresh that, it loads, and then it flickers, and we get the later results there. If I were to put the brake slightly differently, if I were to put the brake on the API itself, so if we put the brake in there, we'll still see the same thing. So there it hits once, and then there it hits the second time, clearly not very efficient. On the other hand, if I just navigate around, so if I go to other and then go back home, it only then hits once because that's entirely being done in WebAssembly. It's only that initial download when you do a refresh or when you navigate to the site in the first place that you get that happening. But you still want to avoid that. That's inefficient, that's repeating yourself, and so we want to fix it. And there's a very simple way to do that that's built in, and that's what I'm going to be showing you as the main part of this video. So let's just get rid of that breakpoint for a second, and let's go to our home. And what we have to do is this. First thing we have to do is we inject into here a thing called the persistent component state. So it's designed for precisely this purpose, and we'll just call that the component state. So that's already predefined for injection as part of your standard Blazor application. And then down here, what we're going to do is add a private field. And this is going to be of type persisting component state subscription that we've got there. We're going to make that nullable and call it underscore subscription. And then in the uninitialized async, and that remember is the thing that's being called twice, once on the server and then again on the browser, we're going to say that, that underscore subscription equals, and then on that component state that was injected, we're going to say register on persisting and pass in there a function that I haven't written yet, persist data. Okay, so we get all of this subscription. Let's write that persist data. So that's going to be a private, and then it's going to return a task, although actually we don't need it to be async, it is in some situations, then we'll grab the name, no parameters. And then what we're doing in here, this function is going to be running only on the server. And what it's going to do is it's going to take the data, the books that have been fetched from the API, and it's going to serialize them to JSON and store them so that they can be transmitted over to the client, over to the browser. And so what we do, again, on that component state, we say persist as JSON, and then we provide a key so that we know what we're looking up. So I'm just going to call that books. And then we provide the data, which is going to be underscore books, which by now should have been fetched from the HTTP client. And then just to finish that off, we've got to return a task.completed task. And so essentially, we're passing in that function that's going to be called later on as part of the persistence process. And so when this code runs initially on the server, essentially what's going to happen, we'll get hold of the books via the HTTP request, and then this code will be executed to store them so that when the uninitialized async gets called again on the browser, we don't have to make the HTTP call, we can just fetch them out of the JSON. And the way we do that is we say if, and then we say component state dot try take from JSON. So we're having a look to see if that JSON storage has been done, which it won't have been on the server, but it will have been on the browser. And then that's actually generic for the type of data we want, which is going to be our I enumerable of books. And then as a parameter, we put in the key that books that we have down there on line 66 for what we're trying to fetch out. And then the actual data, we have an out var, and we'll just call that books. So this is going to either return true and give us those books in that variable books, or return false, in which case we'll have to fetch them from the HTTP. If we have got the books, we can just say underscore books equals books, else, and then we actually do the call. So this one is going to be executed when we're on the server. Then that one is going to take that data and store it. And then on the client, we're going to pick up that data that's been stored as JSON and use that rather than making the HTTP request. 
One other thing we're going to do here, we need to dispose of this subscription. So at the end here, I'll put in a public void dispose and then simply do underscore subscription question mark dot dispose. Remember, it could be null. And then we'll just have to at the top do an at implements I dispose. So that should all be happy there. And that really is all you need to do to get this working. So if we now run that up, then we shouldn't notice very much difference. But what we do notice is we don't get that flicker. So it's not having to make that second call. And we can verify that even more clearly if we put that break back into the API call and then do a refresh here. Obviously, we hit that once. That's the one that's being called from the server. But if we continue, we don't hit it again when we're going around the second time. Another way we can look at that, get rid of that breakpoint and instead put the breakpoints in here. So let's just put it in there. Again, do a refresh. So this time we're running on the server. And so what happens is we actually make the HTTP request. But if I also put a break in there, then we take those books, which are populated from the HTTP, put them into JSON. Then now we're being called on the browser. And so this time we find that the books are there. So we put them back into books and we've got that working and that's all fine. So that's quite a nice way of doing things. Another thing we can do there, if we take a look at the page source, then obviously we've got the pre-rendering, but down the bottom here, there in that Blazor WebAssembly component state, that's where the data is actually being stored. So this is base64 encoding of JSON of the data that we had. And you can see it's quite long, but it's not going to take a huge amount of time to download. But that's what's being found when we do that try take from JSON. That's where it's getting the data back and therefore being able to recreate it. You might argue, well, we've already got the data in there, but we don't really know what the format of that data is. That's just the markup displaying the data. It's not got full features. And so, for example, without that data in there, we wouldn't be able to have things like these buttons that we've got on each item to show the details. That wouldn't be working. That actually leads on to one other problem you get with pre-rendering that I thought would be worth pointing out. If we go back to what we've got here, and at the moment, obviously, these details buttons are working fine. We can see each individual one. But if I do a refresh and then very quickly press the button, you'll notice, let's do that again, that it doesn't work immediately. And the reason is when we do the pre-rendering, although we've got all the markup in there, we don't have any of the Blazor functionality. And so none of the buttons, the menu buttons included, will actually work for a couple of seconds. And so although it's quite nice that we've got this very quick display of the data. It can be a bit off-putting because users, if they act really quickly, and it's a couple of seconds essentially, but if they act really quickly, they won't get the functionality. So ideally, we want to disable those buttons just until the Blazor has loaded. So let's see how we can do that. So in here, what I'll do is, simply enough, I will put in a private bool, and I'm just going to call that enabled defaults to false. And then on the button, let's just put a disabled equals and then at and not enable. So it's simple enough what we've got there. And so that means they'll initially be disabled. And then we want to make it so they're enabled only when we're doing the load on the browser. So you might think what we could do actually, let's just put it in here. And so as well as setting those books, let's in here just say enabled equals true. And if we do that, it all looks as if it's working fine, but there is a problem. You can see there, the buttons were initially disabled, and then just when they're ready, we can click that and it's all working fine. But actually, that's not going to work very well for anything else, because what happens here, if we navigate away and then come back in, you'll see they never get enabled. The reason being that Although if you do a refresh or do a full navigation to the page, then you'll get the pre-rendering followed by the call in the browser. If you navigate within the application, it only needs to call it once and it'll be the one that gets from the API. So if I put the break in there and now let's just navigate away and back, we still hit it, but we hit it and we do have to make the API call even though this time 
we're in the browser. So actually, that's not the way to do it. What we have to do is only enable this when we come into uninitialized async and we're running in the browser. Now, thankfully, that is something that's pretty easy to determine because all we need to do just down here after both of those, we can simply say if, and then there is a class called operating system, which has a lovely static method. You can see, we can look to see if it's Windows or whatever. Those are just the favorites. You can see the Android, but one of the ones we've got in there is is browser. And that's where we want to put the enabled is true. So we can tidy all of that up, put it back to that, get rid of the break. And now when we run it, we can see we've got the disable buttons. They come in after a second or so. That's all working. Whereas if we navigate away and come back, they're just working immediately now because we didn't need to do those two stages of rendering. So that's an initial look at this idea of persisting state. When you've got pre-rendering, then you have these two calls, one on the server, which is fast, one on the browser, which therefore gives you the interactivity. And we've seen how we can avoid making the duplicate call by using this idea of persistent state. There's still a few little issues in here. One problem we have is that actually, even when we're on the server, we're making an API call to ourself, because remember the actual server code is in there. So that's a bit unnecessary. We'll see how to fix that, but we'll do that in a couple of videos time, because the next video is actually going to show you how we can write a class that does pretty much all of this sort of work for us. Because although it's easy enough when you've only got one data source, if you've got multiple data sources, you're finding you're going to have a lot of repetition. You're going to be repeating yourself. And so we'll look at how to fix that in the next video. But I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, do click like, do subscribe, and I'll see you next time.